Japan up close. I think the scale, the scale announced, the announced scale of doubling the defense budget by 20, 2027 came as a surprise. And then it was a little bit, it was slightly qualified because it turned out the budget was not quite secured. And also it turned out it might be not so much, well, not only the defense budget, but the security budget, a security related budget. So that made more sense in a way, because um, I think people were startled with the announcement, but then started questioning the capability or the actual, the political possibilities of of, of uh, completing the um, announced objective. So um, uh, the way it's been announced uh, comes as more realistic in a, in a sense. Um, now then, um, it is it is a major effort for Japan. On the other hand, if you look at Japan's GDP, it's really the situation uh, until now that was out of proportions in a way, because uh, having a 1% GDP budget for the um, world's second and third world power was very low indeed. So the uh, the threshold which Japan has had set to its own, the, the limit, the self-imposed limit of 1% to, to the GDP of the GDP for Japan's uh, defense, uh, but expenditure was quite uh, quite low. So I think it's not so much the um, the new situation that's um, that's surprising as the one the, the one that existed before that. Um, having said that, um, given the context of Japan's pacifism, it is um, it is a big effort. It is also also um, it, it it can appear as a, a breach with the the previous policy. Um, I don't think it can. It really is, in fact. But we'll we'll get to that point later. Um, I think, given Japan's international, the, the context in which Japan operates internationally, um, increasing the Japan budget, the uh, the defense budget makes sense, and um, and for the EU, it's a rather welcome move because it means Japan for the EU and the Western powers in general, it means Japan's prepared to engage with world security issues um, that we all deal with. So I think that was rather good. I think until during the Cold War, Japan's um, form of pacifism was a bit of an isolationism, really. So defense budgets were fixed in isolation as well. There was a, a very inward looking um, tendency. And so I think defense budgets were fixed in terms of um, with a with a an idea of, of preserving Japan's technological advance um, and and keeping the industry industries in, uh, investing in the in, in defense fields I mean in the in the defense field but um but uh it wasn't so much due to threats that Japan decided to expend its um its defense budgets it was more it was more with the idea of um uh keeping the fleet modern uh for instance or or ensuring that the um the um the fighters were 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 up to date but really they didn't have all the capabilities that they they might have had so uh, so uh, the uh, the equipment was um, the equipment was kept modern, but really not not at, at a very advanced stage, really. So I think now the move is to go to a defense budget and objectives and equipment objectives that are fixed by comparison with other countries and countries, and therefore um, in with respect to Japan's defense needs, really, and the threats it faces. So it makes more sense in that in that respect. I think Japan's reacting to an environment which um, it deems dangerous and um, understandably so. Uh, during the Cold War, Japan's uh, pacifism uh, was really a form of isolationism. And as far as international cooperation goes, this started to change from 1992. And an important step was uh, was taken in 2015 with the uh, major overhaul of the security system, international cooperation system, really. As far as Japan's defense policy went, Japan derived its defense needs not so much from its security environment, which as far as it was concerned was fairly stable during the Cold War, but uh, from an objective which was to keep the SDA, the self-defense forces, modern, well-equipped, and the research and defense sector active in the field of defense. And um, I think Japan, the um, war in Ukraine really broke Japan's isolationism in the in defense thinking. Um, so, um, so I wish I wish I could say really that was not the way to go. You know, I wish I could say well, um, well, really it be uh, it is uh, it is not necessary. These precautions are not needed. But I don't think I don't think that's the case. I think Japan is right to take uh, into account uh, Japanese policy. Makers are right to take into account the um, the environment in which they operate, 
they operate. And if anything, it's it's a rather good thing that Japan is no longer fixing objectives uh, in absolute terms, in a sense, uh, but in relative ones. So by by uh, reflecting on the on the needs given given adverse um, adverse threats. Uh, furthermore, for for Japan to act as a part taker in world security and to decide on defense objectives uh, based on threats is really a sign of greater connectedness with the world. And Japan has been building partnerships and um, and seeking to meet NATO recommendations, um, and and was was had had been increasing its its budgets a little bit under Abe Shinzo. And so it's really once one extra step that's been taken. So um, I think it's a good thing for Japan's security and really for the world's. Uh, indeed, we we need more cooperation in view of mounting threats. So, and Japan's really going in that direction. We see it with the new fighter program, for instance. When when you when you look at Japanese observers, there are always people who say Japan is doing too much or doing too little. So you'll always have people who are critical for uh, one way or the other. Whatever Japan does doesn't seem to be to be right. So. Um, I would uh, I would argue that Japan is uh, following its own path, and that's very good. Um, it um, it uh, argues that it uh, is acquiring standoff missiles. Um, one might say that they're nevertheless missiles, um, and then um, and then Japan has labelled its new uh, counter strike capabilities such. You might you it, it, they're they're very similar. In fact, to preemptive strikes, of course. But so one might say, well, the difference, you know, what what difference is there? So um, so Japan, in effect, is doing what everybody else is. But um, I think the difference difference is not so much in the equipment, in the armament itself now, as in the discourse. Once upon a time, it was the case that the armament itself could be different. So Japan acquired jet fighters, but they didn't have the refueling capabilities, for instance. Or Japan stressed that it was acquiring uh, helicopter carriers and and not not um, aircraft carrier carriers. So the difference today is not so much in what Japan is acquiring or what the capabilities of its armament is, as in how it labels uh, its 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 possibilities. And I think I think discourse does make a difference. Uh, the fact that Japan emphasizes a continuity in in the principles, and the fact that it labels what it does um, as as defensive as opposed to um, uh, to possibly um, offensive um, does make a difference. It does show that Japan is still attached to its defensive defense idea um, concept, um, and also that it's um, acting or all, all very international cooperation minded, um, as indeed the term proactive pacifism sought to 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 show. Japan's also extremely transparent with respect to its uh, to its current defense needs and um, its intentions and capabilities, and it even discloses its weaknesses. So I think in all those respects, Japan shows that is, is that it is well-meaning and um, and not seeking to appear aggressive in any way, um, and therefore it acquires capabilities because it is facing countries with with capabilities that it has to match. So that's North Korea and China. Um, and it can't ignore those because um, uh, it would make itself uh, Japan would make itself vulnerable. So it is very understanding. What Japan is doing is very uh, is very understandable. And um, I think it is adapting, but it is also uh, keeping its uh, defense budgets um, uh, at a reasonable level, matching them with the NATO ones. They've been extremely low, so it's, uh, there's a bit of catching up going on, and um, and that seems uh, that seems understandable. And it remains much more uh, cautious, more accountable politically than most governments on defense issues. Um, and uh, much more cautious, for instance, um, you can, uh, I mean, in the defense, um, the exports requirements, Japan is much more, um, much more um, careful than any other country in the, in the West in the way it exports weapons. So I think all those, all those uh, precautions are not just, not just uh, oral ones. Uh, uh, verbal ones. I think they're also. Um, I think they're also meaningful precautions. I mean, political d discourse does matter. Not. Uh, it's not just pretense, and um, and that all shows that Japan seeks to stay within the limits of its um, pacifist, pacif pacifist ideal. I think Abe Shinzo did a lot to initiate that change, and I think he was aware that Japan needed to have more influence on the international scene. Um, so I'm publishing a book uh, where I describe Japan as a discrete leader. Um, and um, I think that's exactly what uh, Abe Shinzo managed to do. And so Japan's influence 
uh, expressed itself over issues such as climate change. I mean, even though even though on climate change it started in the 1990s and then Japan uh, lost a bit of its um, its um, advance after that, um, I think I think Japan shows now that it's very uh, very um, willing to um, to to move for- forward and take the lead. Um, and I think it's managed to indeed show some skills at um, being being um, a, a leader in many respects, m- most visibly maybe in the Indo-Pacific with the Indo-Pacific uh, strat- strategy, the um, vision, uh, the free and um, open Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and I think in, in uh, diversity, in a number of issues like economic security now, uh, Japan Japan has has. Um, has acquired the ability to bear some influence on international policies and and debates, um, and so the the move I believe seems stemmed from a, a an awareness which uh, which I think um, should be credited to Abe Shinzo and his advisors, of course, um, that um, it was important to bear some influence on world debates and on the world stage, and that to do that Japan had to engage more, be um, be. Um, more of a partaker in international debates, um, show display more initiatives, and I think I think Japan's really been doing that for the past uh, uh, 10, 15 years now. With respect to inter- uh, Japan's international partnerships, the um, the new international se- the new um, national security and the new na- national defense um, strategies that's not what they changed most. I mean, I, I, I'd say there's great continuity in that respect. Uh, Japan's been engaging more and more in um, international dialogues, international uh, uh, partnerships in the field of defense, and that's started taking place since 2007 when um, Japan established a, a stronger relationship with Australia, and it's been building on that um, ever since with the uh, RAA, the Reciprocal Access Agreement that was signed only uh, last year and, and now one with the UK. So I believe as far as international uh, partnerships in the field of defense goes, Japan has really done a great deal since 2007 and then and, and onwards, uh, being an active member of Quad um, uh, and um, and engaging in really bilateral bilateral relationships to a much higher level, or in, indeed international ones as well. I mean, getting much closer to NATO, uh, coordinating with the EU to, to a great extent over the uh, Ukraine Ukraine situation, the G7 as well, and um, and getting closer to France um, too, and hoping maybe to have some role in AUKUS. So I think as far as international relations go, the um, national security strategy, national defense strategies show a greater commitment um, and that this is really the way for Japan to go uh, in um, as far as um, uh, because because indeed to face China, the approach has to be much much uh, wider. You can, you can't. Uh, Japan would be very. Um, uh, I mean, the realist approach, which would say, well, you face uh, China militarily through a military response, would be very limited. Japan's taking a much broader stance. It does indeed address the uh, military needs, but it also sees that the issue with China is a power balance in the world. Um, so to counter um, counterbalance that, you need a, a global approach, and therefore. Um, gathering as many countries as possible in order to uh, create a consensus over a common platform. Um, so that could be to help out uh, poor countries. So that's what you see with FOIP, you know, um, uh, uh, development assistance uh, policy that involves infrastructure, that is more, uh, that is uh, involves a broader, broader, broader base. So taking economic considerations into account um, and um, issues like climate change as well. And so so really creating a power balance that will be favorable to um, to the West and Western ideas. So um, Western ideas, which are not just Western ideas, you know, because Japan Japan shows to what extent they're, they're, they're universal, really. You know, the, uh, the rule of law, the inter- international law, the respect for human rights. Um, uh, even though that that's not the the the, the point that's most um, uh, most prominent. I mean the uh, but but definitely even though that's put forward, you know, de- de- definitely liberal values, shall we say, liberal values, including economically. I mean all those all those um, ideas which um, have uh, brought the the world closer and um, and m- m- made it richer to a large extent, including China. Um, these ideas need to be defended now, and Japan knows that if we if we get together, we we can we can create the um, the counter the counterweight that is necessary to um, to face China.
Um, I think the war in Ukraine will be a very important topic, unfortunately. Um, China probably because um, because of the tension rising around Taiwan and the questions um, uh, uh, around 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 the situation there. Um, Japan is also likely to want to bring forward, as far as um, security uh, international security goes, North Korea. Korea. Um, and um, but I think the um, the uh, other issues at, st- at stake are likely to be um, economic security, climate, and they're really all related. But um, economic security, climate change, um, issues like that, and I think Japan um, will be in a very, very comfortable in its, in its new role of being a, a discrete leader. I would say so. In a in um, in uh, Japan, Japan is a NAP negotiator, and I'm sure I'm sure we'll manage to. Um, to bring countries to cooperate further, economic security is a very important issue, I, I suppose. So maybe that that will be the emphasis. Um, it's it's tricky, of course, because um, countries also uh, operate in a global market which is competitive, and so uh, the notion that we could all get together into a sort of by by splitting the sort of rules in the uh, in the supply chain is probably a bit. Um, a bit um, of an illusion. So, how how the two the two aspects of competition cooperation can um, can um, can can be um, can can be reconciled remains to be seen. But I think Japan will be uh, yes, indeed. In a, in a, uh, I mean, there there's lots to talk about, including how to how to uh, put an end or help put an end to the um, war in Ukraine. Japan Up Close.